Married in 1982, they have two adult children, Alicia and Aaron. Pastor Paul Shepard. First Baptist, stand with me as we receive our preacher for the hour, Pastor Paul Shepard. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. It's always wonderful being with my East Coast Church family here at First Baptist Church of Glen Arden. Been coming to this church since 2005. I've met Pastor Jenkins in March of 2005 as he hosted an event for my former radio ministry, Enduring Truth, back in those days. He hosted me, and that was the night I met him in March of 2005. And um, he asked me to preach later that year, December of 2005. is the first time I spoke at this church. I couldn't believe what was going on. I, back then, y'all were at the ministry center. We were having four morning services. And I was seeing folks come in and out in droves. And I had never preached somewhere four times in the same morning. <laughs> and I mean, and the numbers of people during offering time, they would walk me around to these different rooms. I'd say hi to the folk in this room and hi to this one. I said, what kind of church is this? I found out as I kept hanging out with y'all that you are a church that more churches need to be like, a church that loves the Lord, loves worship, loves receiving the word. And so I realized very early on, I need these people in my life. This church has been in my life since 05 and I'm the better for it. I certainly honor pastor in his absence. Pastor and Lady Jean Jenkins are among my dearest friends, and I certainly honor them in their absence. And um, I give honor to not only them, but to the elders of this house and uh, leaders and uh, all, of, all of you. If you're honorable, I honor you. I, trust me, I do. Um, all right, let's do what we do at First Baptist. Just span the aisle, find a couple of folks you can connect with. And here's the way we do it at First Baptist. You say, what are you talking about, we? I'm, I'm part of y'all. I just live in California. But um, get their name. Get their name. The person's on either side so you can call their name when you pray for them. Get their name. Look at them and get their name. They're not as cute as you, but look at them and get, the, get their name so you can call them by name. All right, let's ask the Lord to bless your neighbor. Everybody pray for your neighbor, and then I'll lead us in a prayer. Now, Father, we agree in prayer. Thank you for hearing my prayer on behalf of my neighbor whose hands I hold. Thank you because you're at work in their life to willing to do of your good pleasure. Thank you, Lord, that the good work you've begun, you're going to bring it to completion. And so bless them. Now, somebody came needing a word from you, Lord. Pray that you'll speak a word to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Loose those hands so you can give the Lord some praise. You can go back to your seat, but before you sit down, before you sit down, let me just mention something real quick. 
This message that God gave me to preach this time, I've been blessed to come here every year, most, mostly every year since 05. And um, this, this year, I came kind of expecting to preach one thing. I was, till very, very late, um, I was expecting to preach a particular message. I was really looking forward to preaching it, frankly. And, um, but I had that sense from the Lord, no, there's a, there's a word for right now for that house. And I said, all right. I've been preaching long enough to know it's better to go with his idea than mine. And so I changed. And when they asked me a couple days ago, what are you preaching? I gave them the title we're about to share with you. This isn't a message that's going to resonate with everybody because the title is Get Ready to Move. Now, let me, let me tell you something that doesn't necessarily mean real estate, although for some of you it might include real estate. Uh, so if God's speaking to you about real estate, then, it, then it'll be implied that way. But there are different areas in which we've been living in the wilderness when God intends for us to live in the promised land. And I've been talking all morning long to folks who are saying, I'm sick of the wilderness. It's time for me to get to the place God has destined for my life. So if you are a person, because you know, there are there are some folk who are not disinterested in the wilderness. They're okay with the wilderness. Some people don't see average as an enemy. Average is fine with them. But there are other people for whom average is an enemy. Mediocrity is an enemy. Just getting by is an enemy. And this word is for folk who say, I'm sick of average, I'm sick of mediocre. I want everything God's got for me. And so just announce my subject before you take your seat. Tell your neighbor, let's get ready to move. You can have your seat. Hallelujah. Amen. So if this message is in it for you, if I see you sitting there filing your nails, I won't be offended. I'll just know that's not for you. Not everything is for everybody. But you could just hear by that response, there's some folk here who said, you can, stop, you can file your, no, your, your nails all you want to. I'm going to get everything God wants to say to me today because I am tired of being where I have no business being when God has so much more in my future. Now, let me help you understand something. The text that was read earlier in the service is a text where Moses has just sent 12 spies to the land of Canaan to, to check it out. You uh, who are Bible readers know that Israel had spent hundreds of years as slaves in Egypt. Hundreds of years. God raised up Moses and Moses went and said to Pharaoh, God said, let my people go. And you know the story. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened. In fact, the Bible is real clear. God hardened Pharaoh's heart repeatedly. And you say, well, why would God want his people um, to, to be free and then for him to harden Pharaoh's heart? Because God wanted to show his people, when I've got something better for you, it doesn't matter what's coming against you. I'm going to get you where I destined you to be. 
So God would harden Pharaoh's heart, and then he'd send another plague to show Pharaoh, you better do what I said, and all of that. Long story short, God eventually sets them free. He, you know the story. He opened up the Red Sea, and two million people left slavery and went into the wilderness, and God closed the water in over Pharaoh's army. Why, why they tried to go through there in the first place, I'll never know. And so God showed his people in no uncertain terms, if I'm for you, it doesn't matter who's against you. Here's the problem. Once they got over in the wilderness, they lost sight of the fact that God doesn't bring you out of one thing to leave you in mediocrity. When he brings you out of one thing, it's because he's got something so much better for you on the other side. So... Here they are in the wilderness in Numbers chapter 13, and they've, they're kind of making themselves at home there. And God never intended for them to live in a wilderness. That's a desert. So he sends 12 spies over. Go check the land out. Come back and report. Now, I want you to note the report was to be very, very specific. Moses gave them specific instructions. He said... You read about it in the early part of Numbers 13. He said for them to see what the land is like. See if the people are strong or weak. See if they're few or many. See if the land is good or bad. See if the towns have walls around them or not. See if the soil is fertile or poor. See if the land has trees on it. And bring back some of the fruit so we will see what it's like over there. Those were the specific instructions that Moses gave them. So these 12 men go over, spend 40 days over there. When they get back, at first it looks like they were going to do exactly what Moses sent them to do. Because at first, verse 27 of Numbers 13, they say, yeah, Moses, the land really does flow with milk and honey. And we even brought back some of the fruit, just like you told us to. Brought the fruit back. It looked wonderful. Then those brothers messed up. With one word, you knew this report was about to go wrong. They said, nevertheless. Now, let me help you understand something. Moses gave them instruction to bring back objective information. Objective information. Tell us about the cities. Tell us about the, the ground. Tell us about the trees. Tell us if the people are strong or weak. That's all objective. You don't, your opinion has nothing to do with that. They're facts. I've come to learn as I've lived my life that facts are different than perception. Facts are the data, raw data. Perception is what we think about what we see. And I came to tell somebody, if you plan to get to the promised land, you got to realize God is not interested in your perspective and your perception because that is always going to be skewed in the wrong direction. These dudes came back and said, nevertheless, and then they go on to say, but you know, there's giants over there. And there's walled cities over there. And we saw those people. And, and, and later on, they say, we seemed like we were grasshoppers when we, viewed, when we saw those people. We viewed ourselves as grasshoppers. And they said, and that's the way we look to them. How do they know what they look like to the giants? They didn't talk to the giants because they scared of them. Not like they want to, excuse me, Mr. Giant, uh, explain what, what, you th what you think when you see me. They didn't do that. They were afraid of them, but they said, but based on the way we now see ourselves, we think the giants think the same thing about us. I came to tell you something, just three simple points, but these points, I promise, will change your life if you hear what God is saying to you today. If you plan to spend the rest of your life in the promised land rather than in the wilderness of mediocrity, then you're going to have to do three things. And the first thing is you are going to have to play down your perceived problems. 
play down the perceived problems. What you think is a problem is the problem. It's your thinking. It's not what you're calling a problem. It's your thinking. They said what we saw is problematic because there are giants over there. Notice, God never promised way back in Abraham. Abraham was the first one that got this word about Canaan, about this land. Abraham was told hundreds of years before this time, I'm going to give my people a land and they're going to possess it. God never said to Abraham, well, you know, there's giants over there, so I don't know. The God we serve is not concerned, so what are we doing being concerned? God said, I'm giving you the land. He didn't say anything about giants. So when they get over there and the giants throw them off, you know you're already going in the wrong direction. So number one of the three points, you got to play down the perceived problems. What, what you got to learn to do is to not dwell on what you think might keep you out of your promised land. And instead, you've got to have the, the notion that if God is giving it to me, he knows how to deal with the giants and the walled cities and every other obstacle between me and the promise he's given me. You got you to gotta settle it in your heart. If God has something for you, it doesn't matter what seems to be like an obstacle. God has to deal with that. Your perception is your problem. I can't tell somebody, your problem is between your ears. You think you got a financial problem. No, you got a between your ears problem. You think you got a relational problem. No, you got a, a problem in your thinking. You think you have a vocational problem. You think that the job is wrong or you think that the education, I don't have enough education to do what is in my heart to do. I wish I had learned earlier about these opportunities when I was younger and could go to school. You can still go to school. Who told you you couldn't just because you're getting older? I, I wish I wish I knew this when I was younger and healthier. Well, you're not younger, and you need to get healthy so you can finish doing what God's told you to do. Last year when I preached here, I was 30 pounds heavier than I am right now because I talked to my doctor, and my doctor said, I know that you, you have this plan. You want to retire at 70. And then you really want to enjoy life after that. You, you've talked about the things you want to do after retiring from being an active pastor. You just want to be a spiritual father to your spiritual sons and go around and minister at their churches and minister at your convenience after 70. You don't want to have hands-on pastoring. He said, I've heard you talk about that. He said, well, do, do you plan to be healthy when you get there? I said, yeah, that's the idea. He said, then we got to make some changes right now. Because you can't just want it, you have to make it happen. And I said, I said, yeah, yeah. I, he said, because a lot of folks, when they get, if, the, if they get to, to their retirement age, whatever that is for them, he said, they spend the rest of their life sick. Now, right away, we all know that there are some sicknesses that, didn't, that we didn't uh, bring on ourselves. They happened to us. We get that. I don't want anybody to feel condemned who's wrestling with a sickness that was not something your lifestyle created. So don't let the devil tell you that, um, that pastor's saying something negative about you. Not at all. But we all know that many of the sicknesses we wrestle with in today's world, we have contributed to them by our own lack of discipline or proper decision making. Last year was the worst, was one of the most frustrating years as a pastor of my life. It, I, the worst of my life was 10 years ago, but this last year was the worst in terms of pastoral things. Some things went on. I tried to help a church in Detroit. All kinds of things happened, and it was just not a good year. I couldn't wait for New Year's Eve last year. 
I hated 2018. I'm so glad God brought me into 2019. But the doctor said, but you don't want to just get to retirement. You want to be healthy when you get there. I said, I do. He said, then there's some things you're going to have to change. And he said, and I know you, he said, yeah, I know that you're not one of these kind of people, because I've heard you talk about it, that you will never be one of these folks who don't, who will never again eat certain things. And never, I, I don't roll like that. I got friends. I got plenty of hyper fitness people in my life. I know them. God bless them. I love them, but they special, you know. And um, <laughs> who just, they so hyper and they never, I haven't had anything fried since 1973. You know? <laughs> Bless you. That's so good. I'm so proud of you. I never, I can't remember the last time I had a slice of cake. I can't remember the last time I had a piece of pie. I, that's nice. Bless your heart, baby. I can't roll like that. I said, but I can promise you this, Doc, because I want to reach my goal, I can learn not to let that be my lifestyle anymore. He said, that's all I need from you. He said, if every now and then you want a little slice of something, go ahead and do it. Every now and then you want a little fried something, go ahead. He said, that just can't be your norm. He said, what you got to do is drink a half gallon to a gallon of water every day. He said, that's what you got to do. I said, I can do that. He said, then you got to get into grilled stuff and, and get away from fried stuff as your lifestyle. Grilled, and you got to get into the veggies. Eat them because you need them, not because you enjoy them. He said, I'm not asking you to make that an enjoyable experience. I'm just asking you to open your mouth and stick it in. And just walk me through real, real plain. See, I'm a plain guy. I, like, I don't like it when folks shoot the bread. Uh, tell me the truth. You know, don't, don't, don't. And so he told me this is what you need to do. He said, because that way you can reach your goal. I said, all right, I'm going to do it. I'm going to drink, start drinking water. I'm going to get away from these sodas and stuff. And only every blue moon will I eat a little chicken. I mean, eat a little fried something or eat a little uh, um, uh, sweets or something like that. I said, okay, I can do that. I said, because my goal, you know, Hebrews 12 said, who for the joy that was set before him, Jesus endured certain things. He endured the cross. But the principle is who for the joy you endure. Sometimes you got to endure now to enjoy later. And some of y'all need to make up in your mind in order to get to your promised land, whatever your promised land is, you're going to have to endure some things now so you can enjoy some things later. Because I have a vision. I want to make it to 70 as healthy as I can be at that point. By God's grace, again, there's a, you know, sicknesses happen and that's the world we live in. But at least do all I can to make sure I'm healthy when I get there. Because I see myself sitting under a palm tree in my 70s writing my spiritual sons. Be strong, my son. I got a vision of that. I see that. I got a bucket list. There's some places I want to go, some things I want to do. You got to figure out not only what your promised land is, but you got to stop worrying about what it looks like to you. Play down the perceived problems. Second thing you got to do is you got to partner with the right people. Play down the perceived problems is one thing, but partner with the right people is another. Listen, I have found out too many folk have the wrong people in your inner circle. You will never get to the promised land with folk who are wilderness people. Quit trying to drag your wilderness friends into your promised land. They scared. They don't want to be over there. Some of you need to decide right here and now. There are some folk, they're in my life, but I'm not going to let them be in the inner circle. Just push them out to the far, farther point. The inner circle have to be people of faith. They have to be people of positivity. 
There had to be people who, when you say, I'm believing God for this, they don't tell you what they think. They tell you what God said. Some of you need to surround yourself with people who when you tell them, I'm believing for healing, I believe God has some more stuff I'm supposed to do. Doctor just gave me a bad report, but I'm believing that the Lord's got to raise me up because I got some stuff in my heart I haven't done yet. You got to have people who when you say that, they say, God's going to do it. He's going to heal you. He's going to bring you through. You're fooling around talking to these people and all they do is tell you they got an uncle who died with what you got. How am I get healed when you telling me about your uncle? I need people around me who know how to lock their faith in with where mine is. I'm believing to get out of debt. Oh, girl, I don't think you ever going to get out of that mess you in. <laughs> you know right away, they got to they gotta move out your inner circle. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm tired of debt, and I'm getting out, and you going to tell me why I can't? No, no, I need folk who know the language of faith. <laughs> Not only the language of faith, but people who know what it means to discipline themselves. You're in the right church. You can take these courses. I know how y'all roll. They'll teach you how to get out of debt. In my church, we, we have Financial Peace University, and my members go through Financial Peace University with Dave Ramsey. I don't care what program you work. Just work it. Get out of that debt. It's an enemy. Debt is slavery. And you need to be free. And you need people around you who are aspiring to the same thing. Y'all help one another. You be buddies. Don't go to the mall without me. Because you ain't quite delivered yet. I got to go with you. And you get up in the mall and you see the sign, everything must go. And you think it mean that mean to your house. You need folk in your life who say, well, wherever it need to go, it ain't going to your place. <laughs> Some of you have the wrong people in your inner circle. You got to partner with people of faith. I told you several years ago in 2014 when God blessed us after four years in hotels, the church I started in 2010, we spent four years in hotels, five different cities, five different cities, five different buildings is the way we had church for four years. It's called how not to start a church. <laughs> but the Lord had told me that he had called me to the Bay Area and he wasn't releasing me from the Bay Area. So I needed to stay. And I said, well, Lord, I don't have a church anymore. He said, well, you, that, that's up to you. So I had to start one. I had to move out and do what he told me to do. He said, stay here. And so I started a church and we ended up, we couldn't find any place because, you know, hotels, they don't want you just run, renting a ballroom. They want you to buy the rooms to stay in and they want you to buy food and liquor. And we would just show up and sing and shout. <laughs> and they're like, we're not trying to head at. And so nobody would give me a permanent place to worship. So for four years, we worshiped in five different cities in Northern California. Very inconvenient. But to do God's will, you don't always get convenience. See, some of y'all believe in silver platterology. You think if God gave it to me, just go and drop it in my lap. No, he not. Sometimes you got to fight for it. You got to strain toward it. And that requires you having the right people. Play down your perceived problems, but also partner with the right people. Have people in your life, whatever you got to do, let's get it done. Let's get it done. And so in 2014, we're finally about to go in that building, June of 2014. Fourth Sunday in June, we're scheduled to go into our building that we've been praying and working toward and giving toward. We were going in. 
my oldest member in her early 90s. I got a call June 12th. Move-in date for the church is June 22nd. June 12th, I get a call. Mom's McKean is in the hospital. Doctors just told her she has three to seven days to live. My wife and I jumped in the car, drove to the hospital. She's completely blind. Drove in, kissed her on her forehead, said, Mom's is past and first lady. Said, we came because we just heard that uh, doctor gave you some news. And uh, she, here's what I said. To her. I said, Mom's, so what are you asking the Lord to do? I've learned over the years, I don't impose my faith on people. My job is to agree in faith with what you believe God wants you to do. If she, she was in her 90s, if she ready to go home, I'm not going to try to pre pray her here. You know, because sometimes the old folks say, I'm tired, baby, I want to go home. Well, if they tired just because you want them, you can't keep them here, that's selfish. So I said, moms, what are you asking the Lord to do? Here's what she told me, I promise. She said, well, I gave my, my money to the building. She said, and I don't want to die until I get in there. Now this is June 12th, and the doctors have just told her she has three to seven days, which means by June 19th, she's out of there. And we're going in Sunday, June 22nd. She said, I want to go into my building. I said, all right, laid hands on her, said, Father, in the name of Jesus, Mom's McKean is your daughter, and uh, you brought her through so many things, and now here she is, and the doctors just gave her this news. But Lord, she's asking you to keep her here so she can go in the building with her church, with her pastor and with her church. I said, so Lord, I, I know she's ready to meet you, but she don't want to come just yet, so let her stay here so she can go in with us 10 days from now. I called, doctors had said three to seven days. I called her house on day four because they sent her home to die. Day four, doctor said three to seven, so I thought I'd check in day four. I called the house. I said, Pastor, I haven't heard from the family, so y'all tell me what's going on. They said, oh, well, mom's just sitting up having her hair done. And I said, all right, well, I won't bother her. I just called and check on y'all. <laughs> so I said, all right. The next thing, the doctor says, had three to seven. So we got past three, and I waited till we got to seven. Then I called on day eight. Still hadn't heard anything from the family. So I said, it's past. I'm just calling to check on moms. They said, oh, she's looking forward to coming to church. <laughs> Bottom line is... Ten days later, prayed for her June 12th, June 22nd, the day we're going into our service. We had three services that day. The second service is the one she came to. They wheeled her in there. She came in her wheelchair with the biggest smile you ever saw on her face. I preached that service. I went, walked over to where she was after that service. I kissed her. I said, Moms. Ain't God good? Look at you sitting up here in your church. I said, now, moms, at the hospital, you, I remember you saying you didn't mind if the Lord would take you the day after the service. You just wanted to be here for opening day. I said, so, moms, I, I honestly, this is what I, I said. So, moms, are you still thinking you want to go tomorrow? That's what she is saying at the hospital. She said, well, <laughs> honestly, she said, I'm enjoying it, so I think I want to stay a little while. <laughs> that lady came not only the 22nd opening day, she came fifth Sunday, June 29th, 2014. She came every Sunday in July. She came every Sunday in August. She came every Sunday in September. She came the first two Sundays in October. 
Then she got sick enough where she had to stay home, but still home alive the rest of October, all of November, and got into December. That woman lived six months after the doctor said she was supposed to be dead. I came to tell somebody, stop playing up to perceived problems. Play them down. Partner with the right people. If you trying to live, quit talking to folk who trying to kill you off. Last thing, pursue the promises and possibilities God has given you. You got to pursue them. You got to go after it. Stop believing in silver platterology. God's not going to drop it in your lap. When he gives you the vision, you have to make it happen. He'll give you the power. He'll give you the insight. He'll give you the wisdom. He'll give you the partners. But you have to make it happen. It's not going to happen without you making it happen. God says yes. Let me, give, let, let me end with a, a scripture a lot of people misinterpret. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 is a verse where Paul is talking about the fact that the Corinthians expected him to be there and he had plans to be there and he hadn't made it. And he's writing them, eventually, I'm, I'm going to come, but I haven't been able to make it yet. And he said, I heard some of, some of them are, are saying, you can't trust his word. He said, no, no, I'm coming. He said, all, then, he, then he made it a teachable moment. He said, for all the promises of God are yes. And King James makes it sound like an Yes and amen. So a lot of folks say, well, you know, the Bible says all the promises of God are yes and amen. No, look at it more carefully. The structure of the Greek uh, that it was written in says all the promises of God are yes, and the amen must be spoken by us to the glory of God. Amen. Meaning when God says yes to something, it's not going to happen until you say amen. Amen. God can say yes, but sometimes we say no. Sometimes God says yes, and we say nevertheless. Sometimes God says yes, and we say but. You got to get your conjunction out of God's business. If God said it, you got to get in agreement with it. Amen means so let it be. I'm believing that this is going to happen in my life. At the 2019 ESPYs Award, for you who aren't in the sports, the ESPYs is for sports what the Grammys and Oscars are for people in the entertainment business. At the 2019 ESPYs Award show, a man named Rob Mendez was presented with the Jimmy V Award for Perseverance. He's a football coach. He was presented with that particular award because he's persevered through so much to be a successful coach. Last season, his team had a, a record of eight and two. They only lost twice in the whole season. But he got the award for perseverance. You say, well, what's the big deal? There have been a lot of successful coaches. No, this is a coach who has never held a football in his life. This is a coach who has never run on a football field in his life. In fact, he's never run, period. Because this man was born with no legs and no arms. Rob Mendez does not know life with limbs. He rolled onto the stage that night. They have a special cart that he gets around in. Rolled onto the stage. Thousands of the world's greatest athletes gave him a standing ovation. And when the noise died down, here's the first thing he said. I want to give praise to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. He went on to talk about the fact that football was in his heart. And from the moment God put football in his heart, he knew his calling was to help people play it well. That he didn't know how to hold one, that he had never held one, never run anywhere, was not the issue. And he spent his life 
learning how to be an excellent coach. And he ended his speech that night saying, when you dedicate yourself to something, open your mind to different possibilities and focus on what you can do instead of what you can't do. He said, if you do that, you'll really go places in this world. He said, I've made it this far, and who said I can't go farther? Nobody. I came to tell somebody, you've made it this far because God has plans for your life. But if you want to get all the way into your promised land, you got to play down the perceived problems. You got to partner with the right people. You've got to pursue the promises and possibilities God has set before you. If anybody received that word, stand with me. Stand up, everybody. Before we go, we got some spiritual business to take care of. I'm preaching 6.30 at the ministry center. It's going to be a follow-up of this message I've been preaching this morning. It's pretty much part two because I want to give you some strategies for winning in the second half. I don't care how good your first half has been, no game is won in the first half. If you want to win, you got to win at the end. And I'm going to talk to those who come to the ministry center at 630 about some strategies, nothing profound, just simple but necessary so that you can win in the end. If you know somebody who could probably use a word like that, tell her to meet me 630 down at the ministry center. Meanwhile, I want to call to this altar four categories of people. First of all, those of you who need to be saved. I need the Lord in my life. Trust me when I tell you there is no success ultimately outside of Christ. Oh, you could have success in the world's way. But Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his soul? So if you need to be saved, step out of that row. The title of this message is Get Ready to Move. I want you to move right now. Move toward this altar. I want you to come on down and let us pray with you as you receive Christ into your life. Secondly, there are those of you who are backsliders. What that means is you once asked the Lord into your life, but you haven't been walking with him. You're kind of like the prodigal son who took off, lived in a foreign country, and wasted his wealth in riotous living. You've been doing your thing, but you know your heart belongs to God. It's time for you to come home. I want you to come. Those who need to be saved, come on. Those who need to be reclaimed, come back into fellowship with God, come on. Come on, that's right, I see you coming. Third, there are those who are spiritually unsure. That is, you're really, you really don't know where you stand with God. You really don't know where you stand with God. I'm here to tell you, that you can leave here sure of your relationship with the Lord. They're coming, they're coming, they're coming. And finally, if you're saved, but you don't have a church home, or you need to change to a healthier church, I, or the Lord's just calling you here for his own purposes, even if you're not leaving because of a poor health in another church, you're just coming because you sense God wants you here, I want you to come. So those four categories, come on, come on right now. I need to be saved. I'm coming back into fellowship. I'm spiritually unsure and I want to be sure. Or I'm saved and I want First Baptist to be my church home. Because you got to hook up with the right people. You got to partner with the right people to get where God's taking you. Come on, we're waiting for you. They're coming, they're coming. We're waiting for you. Father, if anybody feels stuck where they stand, loose them in Jesus' name. Come on, if you know you need to be here, quit standing there and make a move. Make a move, make a move. It's in your best interest to make this move. Hallelujah. We're waiting on you. That's right, young man. We're waiting on you. Come on, come on, come on. He will give you praise. He will give you praise. My 
Jesus. That's right. That's right. In your best interest. I'm coming to Jesus. I'm returning to fellowship. I want to be spiritually certain. I want to join this church. Any of those categories, I want you to come right now. Don't put it off. Come right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Anybody else? I'll give you 30 more seconds to come on down. The rest of your life requires that you are in the right place with God and in relationship with others. So I want you to come if you need the Lord. I want you to come if you need a healthy church. Amen, amen, amen. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. If I see you moving, we'll wait for you before I hand it off. Amen, amen, amen. That's right. That's right. That's right. Glory to God. Amen. Let's thank God for this harvest. Let's, let's put our hands together, saints. Let's give the Lord the praise as to his name. What a wonderful harvest of souls. Amen. An amazing, amazing message. And the Bible says that the angels in heaven rejoice. I just talked to Cyrus, who's 20 years old. He came down with his, with his friend. She's not sure of her salvation. She wants to make sure that she is sure. Somehow to say amen right there. I asked Cyrus, why did you come down? And he said, I want to get saved. Amen. amen. And, and all of you who are here, all of you who are here, we thank God for you. We've been praying for you. And behind you, there is a counselor. And they're going to talk to you about where you are spiritually in your walk with God. They're going to pray with you. They're going to talk with you. And today's an awesome, incredible day. But I cannot go further without obeying the Lord. I believe there is a couple more people that should be here. You was needing a word from God. You need a change in your life. You need to get moving. Maybe you've been feeling like you've been stuck. The man of God has preached his heart out to us today. But the Lord just saying, I just got to hold on for just a second. If you're here, again, we want to give you that opportunity. God sent you today. God sent Pastor Shepherd to minister that word to you today. And he wants you to get moving. Saints, go ahead and start praying. And we're going to give you 30 seconds. If you will, just make your way out of your seat. You want to get saved. Maybe you're backslidden. Maybe you're unsure. Maybe you're looking for a church home. Saints, would you pray while the choir ministers that song? Praise give you brand new life, oh. Wherever you are, we're waiting on you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you, Father. Bless you. Praise you. Praise you. Life abundantly. Life abundantly. He will give you brand new life. Life abundantly. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks. We give you praise. We love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the power of the spoken word. We thank you that you have 
have ministered to us today. Now, Lord God, we thank you for these who have responded. We thank you for obedience of those who, who came forward at the very last appeal. And we thank you, God, that they too will be ministered to on this day. We love you. We honor you. We thank you. We know there's much rejoicing in heaven even now. We love you. We magnify you. We praise you. You're an awesome and amazing God. Do what only you can do in the lives of these who've come. And we thank you and we bless you even now in Jesus' name. And the people of God said, amen and amen. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. God go that way. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated in the Lord's presence. Let's give them another hand as the Lord. Let's give the Lord a hand as we thank him for these who have come. Amen. Amen.